Okay, welcome everyone. Thanks for attending. Um, my name is Erin O'Brien. I'm a BCBA that works out of NeuroAbilities Cherry Hill Clinic. Uh, prior to becoming a BCBA, I worked as an LDTC, which is a learning disabilities teacher consultant, um, on the child study team and as a special education case manager for a New Jersey school district. Um, I also have worked as a developmental interventionist for the New Jersey Early Intervention System. So both of those jobs have allowed me to become really familiar with the special education process, what's included in IEPs, and um, just the overall how you go about getting an IEP. Um, and I know that process can be really overwhelming for parents and families. Um, there's a lot of information that's thrown at you. You're meeting a lot of different people that have a lot of different roles, and it can be very overwhelming and confusing. Um, so my hope is that tonight we can kind of talk about what that transition looks like and make it a little more clear and also kind of discuss when that transition should happen, um, if it should happen when your child's three or maybe you wait a little bit longer. So the topics we're going to discuss tonight are um, how to initiate an individualized education plan process or IEP process. The members of the child study team, um, we're going to talk about who they are and what their roles are, what they do. We're also going to talk about some important components of an IEP. There's a lot of information contained in an IEP. Um, there's a lot of pages, but we're going to kind of focus on the more important areas you should be aware of. And also we're going to discuss when it's the appropriate time to transition your child to school services. So we're going to talk about how to get an IEP. So the first thing you need to do is make a referral to your school district. Then within 20 calendar days, you will have an identification meeting scheduled. At that meeting with the child study team, you will write, they will write an evaluation plan. Um, and this evaluation plan will uh, discuss what evaluations they will complete to determine eligibility for special education. Once the evaluations are complete, you'll have what's called an eligibility meeting where your child may or may not be classified depending on the results of the evaluation. And if they are eligible for special education, at that point, they will develop an IEP or an individualized education plan. So we're gonna go into more detail about each of these steps now. So for the first step is making a referral. Um, and this is a referral to the school district or school district of residence. Uh, this must be in written form. Districts likely will accept an email, but it cannot just be a phone call. You have to have it in writing. Um, in that letter, you're gonna state that you're requesting an evaluation by the child study team for your child and that due to the concerns that you have, and you can be specific, you can be vague, but as long as you mention that you're requesting an evaluation by the child study team, that should be enough. Um, this kit request can be made by people other than the parent. Um, it doesn't just have to come from the parent. It can come from school personnel um, or another agency concerned with the child's welfare. So for example, the New Jersey Early Intervention System, if your child receives early intervention services, they will initiate the referral to your school district. And typically they'll do this 120 days prior to your child's third birthday. So children will age out of New Jersey Early Intervention at three, and at that point, the school district should take over. So the reason they do it 120 days prior is to make sure services can immediately transfer to the school district at that third birthday. This letter can also be addressed to any appropriate school official. You can send it to the school principal, the child study team case manager, the director of special education. Um, there's no specific person it needs to go to, just any appropriate school official would work. So once you write that letter, you'll be scheduled what's called an identification meeting with the child study team. So before we get into the details of the identification meeting, we're gonna talk about who the child study team members are. So first, we're going to talk about the school psychologist. Um, the school psychologist will complete an evaluation um, that does aptitude or IQ testing. It's called a psychological evaluation. They're going to look at the strengths and weaknesses of your child and their level of intellectual development based on the assessments that they complete. They're also going to look at the child's social and emotional status and how these factors may affect their education and school performance. The next member is the Learning Disabilities Teacher Consultant, or LDTC, and uh, this is the role that I previously held. This person must have been a, teacher, a certified teacher in the past, so they bring that background to the role. Um, and this person will complete what's called a learning evaluation, which is just achievement testing. So they're going to look at your child's academic achievement, their learning styles, and they'll also provide recommendations for specific teaching, teaching methods and materials that may accommodate your child's needs in school. 
And the final core member of the child study team is the school social, social worker. And the school social worker will complete a social history. Um, and that will assess the child in relation to their family and community. They'll gather information uh, typically from the parent regarding developmental milestones and the child's health status. Um, they'll also look at family history and any information about previously or currently received services just to give a, straw, a nice background to the team of where your child's coming from in their history. So these three people are your main, the main individuals that are, make up the child study team. They're the required people that need to be there. And one of these three people will be assigned as your child's case manager. So that's the person that will be your contact person throughout the entire process. And should your child be classified, they will be in charge of holding the annual reviews and ensuring that the IEP is implemented. However, depending on your child's needs, other personnel may be included on the team. Um, these could include related services personnel, such as speech therapists, occupational therapists, or speech therapists. BCBAs or behavior consultants may be included, an audiologist or a school nurse. It would really depend on your child's specific needs of who the other members of the team. But the three that I've listed here with asterisks are the, the main members that must be present. So, at the identification meeting, this meeting must be held within 20 calendar days of the date of your letter. So once they receive that letter, they have 20 calendar days to schedule this identification meeting with the child study team. At this meeting, you'll, you'll attend as well, and you'll be able to share any information about your child's strengths and weaknesses, any relevant medical diagnoses, and any concerns that you have regarding their performance in school or how they will perform in school. At this meeting, the team will listen to all the information and then they will make a determination on if an evaluation will be completed. Um, likely, if you're coming into this, like you're a young child and you're coming in with a diagnosis and previous services, an, an evaluation will be completed. But there are times where maybe if a child's just kind of struggling in school and they have a meeting, the parent has a meeting, um, they may determine that like other interventions need to be put in place before special education is done. But typically, if a child's coming in already receiving services, they will. Uh, conduct an evaluation. So at that identification meeting, they're going to write what's called an evaluation plan. So if an evaluation is warranted, they'll write this plan that will include any of the evaluations that will be conducted and who will complete them. Um, the evaluations cannot be done until you sign this document. Without your signature, nothing can start. Once they have your signature, the team has 90 days to complete all of their evaluations and then hold an eligibility meeting. You should receive all of these evaluations at least 10 days prior to the eligibility meeting to give you time to review them and to look over them so you're prepared with any questions that you might have. So once the evaluations are complete, they'll schedule the eligibility meeting and all the members of the team that completed evaluations will be present they're gonna review their reports, their findings, any, and any recommendations they're going to make. And they'll also answer any questions that you have about the evaluations done. Then with this information, the team will make a determination of eligibility. They'll determine if your child is eligible for special education. So there are 14 classification categories that you can be classified under. Um, and each one has its own specific criteria that must be met based on the New Jersey Special Education Code or law. Um, so if a child, any child that is between the ages of three and five, if found eligible, will be classified as a preschool child with a disability, regardless of what the issue is, every child between those ages is classified under that category. And there are specific criteria that must be met in order to be classified under this category. So I'll go over them, but it's um, a 33% delay in one developmental area or a 25% delay in two or more developmental areas as measured by the, the diagnostic instruments they use. So they're gonna complete their evaluations and based on those, if they find those delays, your child will be found eligible. Or your child has a disabling condition that would adversely affect their learning and development. So either one of those things need to be found in the evaluations they completed in order to find your child eligible for special education as a preschool child with a disability. At the age of five, your child is no longer eligible under that category as your child will be reevaluated. The team will meet, they'll reevaluate your child, and they will reclassify them under one of the other 13 categories that exist. So, some examples of these categories are autism, other health impaired, specific learning disability, communication impairment, multiply disabled. So, there's 13 other categories that each have their own specific criteria 
that your child can be classified under. An important thing to note is just the presence of a disability does not make your child eligible for special education. It must impact their educational performance. So if there's a child, for example, that's diagnosed with ADHD, but they're performing well in school and you know, their education is not being impacted, they would not be eligible for an IEP. And then finally, once the child is classified and found eligible, you will determine, you will develop the IEP. Sometimes it's done right at that same meeting. Sometimes, depending on how long the meeting is gone, they may re-meet to write the IEP. So what exactly is an IEP? An IEP is a legal document. And as I mentioned, it's many pages long. It can, contains a lot of legal ease. So we'll kind of talk about later the specific parts you should really focus on. It's covered by federal law and the federal law is the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act or IDEA. And the point of an IEP is to lay out the instruction and the supports and services that your child needs to succeed in school. And this legal document says that your child will receive these services and should receive these services. So as I mentioned, there's a lot of uh, information in an IEP, but we're going to go over some important components of it. Um, so the first one is the present levels of academic achievement and functional performance. This is also called the PLATH statement. Um, and it's a narrative that discusses your child's strengths and weaknesses and their current performance and functioning. So for your initial IEP, this should include the skills and abilities uh, that were um, gone over during the initial assessment and the evaluations that the team completed. It should also include all the developmental areas that your child requires support in. The next important component is parental concern. So at the meeting, the, the team will ask you what concerns you have, and these, those will all be documented in the IEP. The next important component is the goals and short-term objectives. So these goals should be objective, observable, and measurable, and they should be specific to your child's needs. Um, these are the, the goal is the main thing that your child will demonstrate within 10 to 12 months time. So your IEP is good for 12 months and the goals included are what your child should achieve during the length of that IEP. And they're also directly related back to that PLAF statement. So any of the areas of concern that were acknowledged in the PLAF statement, the goal should relate right back to those. The objectives that they can include are just those smaller steps that the child will accomplish on the way to achieving that overall goal. Um, another thing that will be important to look for is the extent of participation in the general education curriculum. So there will be some statement um, indicating how much of the day your child will spend in the gen general education setting with exposure to the general education curriculum and general education peers. Now, this will look different depending on what your child's level of support and needs are, um, but it's important to kind of look for hopefully that they're included at least some part of the day. So if they need a higher level of support, they, should, they could be included during specials such as music and art and gym. Um, so you wanna have some kind of statement to the extent that they will be participating with their general education peers. Also included important in the IEP are accommodations and modifications. And again, these should also be specific to your child. Um, these are the tools that are used to adapt the curriculum for your child to allow them to be successful. So accommodations are anything that helps the student learn. And some examples of what these could be are adaptive writing utensils, movement breaks or rest breaks throughout the day, preferential seating, use of visual schedules, and as they get older, maybe extended time to complete assignments. Examples of modifications. So modifications would cover any changes to what the child is expected to learn. So these are things that probably would come into play more as your child gets older and further on into their education and would include having things like a pass or no pass option rather than a graded, graded assignments, um, maybe modifying the length of the assignments they complete, typing assignments versus handwriting them, rewording questions in simpler language. So all these things can be spelled out and should be provided to your child if it's something that they need to uh, be successful in their education. And finally, the last thing that's really important to look for are the specific special education related services and supplementary aids and services that will be provided. So in the IEP, it will list specifically the type of classroom that your child will be in, whether it's a self-contained classroom or if 
um, a special education teacher is going to push into the general education setting. That will be spelled out. Um, the other thing that will be included are any related services. So if your child's going to receive um, speech therapy or occupational therapy, physical therapy, that will be included in this part. If your child gets a one-to-one -one aid in the classroom, that will be listed as well. If your child requires a bus aid or special transportation, consultation with behavior consultant, any of these things, the specific services that they will receive will be listed in the IEP. It will also include how often the child will receive those services, the duration or how long they occur, whether the service is gonna occur in the classroom or be a pullout service, if it's occurring as an individual service or in a small group. All of this will be spelled out and it's something you really wanna check and make sure it's correct before you sign the IEP. Um, just to make sure there's not any errors or that the services that was agreed that were agreed upon are actually included. Other things you want to have uh, consider about IEPs are that an IEP is fluid. It's a fluid document. It can const it can be changed at any time. So if you have your annual review or your initial IEP and you sign it, you are not stuck with that for 12 months. You have at any point you can call a meeting and ask for any changes that you want to be made. So I think that's really important to note is that if anything in the IP could be changed at any time. The other thing um, that I wanted to point out is that parents must sign the initial IEP for services to begin. So you can go through the entire process, get to that IEP and decide you don't wanna do it. And if you don't sign it, nothing will happen. No services will be provided. The district is not allowed to do anything without that signature. Each year after your, your initial IEP, you will have what's called an annual review. Um, and this is a yearly meeting that must occur um, where you'll review your child's progress from the previous year and then plan for the following year. However, with an annual review, a, a parent signature is not required for it to continue. So without your signature, that new IEP will go into effect within 15 days. So if you have any concerns about that IEP or any, you, you know you want to have further clarify things, you wanna make sure you do it within that time frame because after 15 days, that IEP will go into effect with or without your signature. Also, um, once classified, it doesn't mean your child's classified further out their entire school career. You, your child will be reevaluated every three years. And this is just to determine if they continue to be eligible for special education. Um, you know, we don't wanna keep, keep kids in special ed forever unless they need to be there. So. Every three years, they'll redo their testing, they'll redo their evaluations, and they'll see if your child still continues to meet the criteria. Sometimes they may switch categories, so they no longer qualify under one category, but they may qualify under a different category or classification. Um, but this will be done every three years. Also, this is kind of in the future as your children get older, but um, starting in third grade, children are required to participate in the New Jersey State Assessments. Um, so with an IEP, your child will be entitled to accommodations and modifications during that assessment, and those should be listed and specified in the IEP. The um, testing may also be waived, and they may be provided an alternative assessment, but that will all be discussed at the annual review prior to your child's third grade year, but just something that it's important to be aware of. And also something else that comes further down the road is transition planning. So starting at the age of 14, any child with an IEP um, the team will start planning for that transition to adulthood and that all those plans that are going to be put in place to allow that transition to be successful will, be, will start to be documented at the age of 14 within your child's IEP. So uh, now we can kind of talk about the parent's role in a child study team meeting. Um, it is, you are a member of the team. You're a very important member of the team. You're kind of, you should contribute. Um, so I'm just going to talk about some of the things you can expect to do during a child study team meeting. Um, so you can share information about your family's culture and expectations. You can share what you're looking to get out of your child's education and where you hope for them to be. You can provide some insight in what your child is like at home and in the community. Kids act very different in very different settings. Um, we can, we're all kind of aware of that. In school is very different than at home, than it's different at grandma's house. So you can share information about how your child acts in different areas and settings within their life. Um, you can also talk about your child's strengths and interests. This will really help the team know how to motivate your child or engage with your child. Um, it's really important information for any individual working with your child to have. You can also provide all of that relevant information regarding your child's medical and social history. Um, all that background information is really important to get a clear picture of your child. 
And also you can share what has and has not worked in the past. The team may recommend an intervention that you've already tried and you can let them know that didn't work, but this did, um, which is really helpful as well. And finally, you wanna be prepared to advocate for ways to meet your child's needs in the least restrictive environment. Um, you know your child best and you really wanna be prepared to you know, speak up and let the team know what you want for your child. So as I mentioned, you are an appointment member of the team and you know your child best. You wanna be prepared to advocate for their needs. Um, and IP meetings can be very overwhelming. As I mentioned before, uh, you're gonna hear a lot of information. You're gonna meet a lot of people. So these are just some things that I usually recommend to parents to help them out during a meeting so they're not as overwhelmed. Write down your questions ahead of time. Keep a paper and a pencil on the counter. Questions are gonna pop in your head as you go along. Jot them down so that you don't forget to ask them. Another thing I suggest is to bring in pen, a pen and paper to the meeting so that way you can take notes while it's happening. You're gonna be hearing a lot of information. Um, it's really hard to digest it in the moment. So you wanna be able to write it down um, just so you can reference back to it later. Sometimes too, it's really helpful to have a second set of ears. Um, I know in today's world, it's hard for, you know, if both parents are able to attend, but if you can bring some, I don't recommend going on your own. If you can bring at least one other person with you just to hear the information as well, in case you miss something, um, it just sometimes helps to be able to process everything that you hear during a meeting. And the other thing I really recommend is to review everything before you sign it. Um, again, it's a lot of information that's being thrown at you. Take it home, take your time, look over it, jot down any questions, go back to the team, ask, have your questions answered. Uh, don't feel pressure to sign it at the moment. So now we're gonna get into the question of when should you start this process? When do you transition your child to school from ABA services? And ultimately it really just depends. There are so many factors that need to be considered. Every child is different. Every child has different strengths and deficits and areas of concern. Also, every family situation is different depending on the needs of the whole family. So you really need to take all of those factors into consideration when you're making this decision. Um, it is important to note that legally children do not need to be enrolled in school until they're six years old in the state of New Jersey. Kindergarten is not a requirement and there's no mandate for special education. So even if your child is determined to be eligible or the early intervention system like refers your child, you're not required to follow through. Um, you can decide if the current services that your child's receiving are more beneficial. There's no uh, requirement that you follow through and get an IEP with your school. There's also no specific timeline. So your child may be turning three and you're really happy with the progress they're making and you don't wanna make any changes. Maybe you revisit the idea when they turn four or five and start to think about initiating that process at that point. There are other options as well. You can work with your school and see if they're open to having your child attend half a day for, for preschool and half a day for ABA services. But ultimately there is no obligation to begin school services until the age of six when you're legally required. So the best thing you can do is to talk to your child's BCBA, start the discussion, um, decide together the best path forward for your child Research does show that children who receive early intensive behavior intervention at a young age increase cognitive and adaptive functioning. And although some classrooms may be labeled as an ABA classroom, they're not really, and they're using the principles of ABA, they're not providing the support that early intensive behavior intervention does of a one-to-one -one instructor and a BCBA at the intense level um, that your child would currently be receiving. It's not as intense in the school setting. Um, it's always better, in my opinion, to postpone for as long as possible um, and really see if your child has those prerequisite skills that they need for school. So look at how your child's communicating, what their adaptive skills look like and their social skills. We want to make sure that they go into school with a strong set of prerequisite skills that will allow them to be successful. Also, a lot of our clinic services include activities that mimic the classroom. Um, so it gives your child exposure to these type of activities in a more supportive setting that will allow them to be more successful when they transition to that less supportive setting. Also, services that are provided in the home can still work on these prerequisite skills um, just to really get your child a strong foundation before they transition into the school setting. Um, it's also, I do want to point out also that once they do transition to school, that doesn't mean that they have to be done with ABA. School generally doesn't work on adaptive skills or activities of daily living. The early years of school are very focused on academics. 
So ABA can, can continue to address those skills and those needs while your child attends school. But the biggest message that I wanted to send is that there really is no rush to start school services. A more intensive approach is so beneficial at a young age, and it really provides a strong foundation of skills for when they eventually do transition to that school setting that will allow them to succeed and grow and thrive. The longer that we can provide a more intensive level of service, um, the better the outcome and the more successful your child can be when they do eventually transition to the school setting. So I included some resources um, for parents to look at. Uh, the first one is the prize booklet or parental rights and special education. When you attend your identification meeting, and I believe every year you have to, you will be given a copy of this, but I included it just for you to reference beforehand if you wanted to become familiar with it. It's very parent friendly. It lays out the steps that are involved, the kind of what I reviewed tonight, and also talks about if you are in disagreement or you want something else, the steps that you would follow um, to go about that with the school district. I also included a link to the New Jersey Special Education Code, and this is just strictly the law in New Jersey. Um, it also spells out everything. And then also a link for just um, a generic annotated IEP form. Every district's form looks a little different, but it all has to contain the exact same information. So this will just help you familiarize yourself um, with the form prior to any meetings that you attend. <laughs> 